Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Klingsheim. Hey everyone, Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Glad you could join us again for our podcast this week. Each week we talk to a different business leader. This week we uh, conclude our conversation with Byron Laughlin. Byron is the uh, CEO and founder of the Center for Board Excellence and uh, he has a background as a CEO, has been a director and uh, a leader and is seen as a expert in the area of board governance. And uh, we're looking forward to our second part of our conversation with Byron this week. What advice would you give that person kind of moving into more of a uh, tension-filled environment? Well, that's gonna be a challenge. I, I would also, um, I mean, realistically, if this is in most business and even some not-for-profit environments, you want to have some sort of legal resource. And when I say that, someone with legal experience is usually in any business or not-for-profit area. There's usually a friend or a lawyer that's, that's nearby that you can, you, depending on the exact situation, you, you may need to retain this person more as a consultant than as a, quote, lawyer. Right. And, and get good legal advice on how to proceed. And when I say good legal advice on how to proceed, I've, I have in, in my set of relationships, I have several lawyers who provide professional advice to, to me and to us that are being paid to do that in some way. But it's not so much lawyering as it is good justice advice, I might call it. What is a just way to deal with a contentious situation? And how do we resolve this with the least amount of damage to the organization? And we find settlements or relationship building exercises in which um, we, we mitigate the risk. Um, because the situation you're describing, let's assume for a minute, there's no you know, Shangri-La kind of outcome. This right. isn't, everybody's not going to be happy in the end. So it's, it's getting to a resolution that is acceptable for all, all parties at, at um, probably at every business school in any environment. But we spent a lot of time at Harvard talking about our ZOPA, the zone of possible agreement. And you've, and then your BATNA, if people want to look it up online, it's a, it's a great tool to figure out where do you walk away or how do you find ways to for consensus, for sufficient consensus right. and negotiation to where there's an area of possible agreement mm -hmm. to limit the walk away point. And so there's the BATNA and the ZOPA, the uh, BATNA best alternative to a negotiated agreement and the, uh, or close to that, and then the ZOPA. So if you're listening to this I, and you've never heard those two terms, just Google them and study that a little bit. It's a great tool to have in your back pocket at any given moment in a negotiation. Mm, interesting. But I know you do work outside the U.S. Uh, talk about kind of board governance, how it, how it differs uh, from the, the U.S. Uh, and I know you've worked in Europe and in mm -hmm. other parts of, of the world. Talk a little bit about that, what you've seen. Well, it's, it's very interesting today um, because the United States, we tend to have a system that evolves more. And what I mean by that, it can be legal precedents. Um, in, in our country, the Delaware Court of Chancery, because a lot of corporations are formed in Delaware for, um, for the uh, tax and corporate formation purposes, it's become a, uh, almost like a tradition in this country. And under the Court of Chancery, there are essentially three, and these extend to any board member. And it's and, and these come out of um, a historical point is, is 1992 and a thing called the Cadbury Report out of the United Kingdom. But at the same time, there were things going on in this country. Uh, Bill George, who's now a professor at, at, at Harvard, um, was also initiating activities at Medtronic and other companies were doing this kind of thing about what are the duties of a board and it's duty of care duty of monitoring or oversight and duty of loyalty. And, and there's varying 
other descriptions, but it really comes down to those three. And I think the first one is fascinating to me. And if, if you're interested, we, if someone's interested listening, the, we wrote a, a short piece, but I think it's, I, I hope it's pretty good on the duty of care because it's a fascinating word. The notion of care, hmm. I mean, think about how much a mother cares for her child. Well, it's similar to way a board member should care for its organization. I mean, there is a familia type of relationship between the leadership of an organization and an organization. I mean, many, many of the businesses in the world today are started by families, right. uh, mother or father or group. And, um, and therefore, it's interesting, globally, there is a similar, and I use that metaphor because there is a similar context in many of the, of the larger companies, I mean, countries of the world, and even China is evolving a bit this direction towards focusing on this responsibility to one, support those three duties and define those well. And then interestingly enough, there, there, I, this started in simultaneous, we had started the Center for Board Excellence um, and there was no one mandated a board assessment. Hmm. In, in late 2010, the, um, the United Kingdom corporate governance code was released and it mandated a board assessment at least every three years um, to be conducted by an outside party. Now, the New York, um, both the New York um, Stock Exchange listing, um, your agreement to be on the New York Stock Exchange and the UK corporate governance code required some sort of board of assessment, but usually that was kind of like an end of the session um, quick, you'd fill it out on one page piece of paper. It wasn't what we consider today to be an assessment of the board, the board's culture, the mission and values, it's, it's, uh, and those three duties that we're talking about. It's much more intensively focused today on, on how do we assess good corporate governance, and that's being done similarly globally. So the countries, particularly that um, the EU for the most part, is, uh, is following out of the Cadbury report in 92, um, many of the countries, United Kingdom, Scandinavian countries, and, and what's evolved out of that is the UK, this, I mean, not the UK, I'm sorry, the um, Australia, Canada, and South Africa, all because of their British influence, had followed the, uh, the Cadbury court report and the UK code um, which was first came out in the early 2000s, and they've the world now today is following a similar set of examples, and uh, and there are other organizations now that have formed over the last several years, um, some under the UN and so on, that are encouraging a more global approach to the the code of conduct for boards of directors. So it's becoming more common. And then that is drifting over to and being augmented in the private world of, um, because a lot of larger private companies say, I don't really want to go public because of all the hassle, right. but I want to behave well. And what does well look like and what does well mean? Uh, and that's, that's where companies like ourselves are, are trying to help augment that definition. Okay. So you've had a, an interesting seat, seeing a lot of different organizations uh, and seeing a number of leaders that you've absorbed, uh, observed over the, uh, the mm -hmm. last several years. Uh, looking back on what you've learned uh, in your career, if you're able to go back uh, to a, a 22 year old uh, Byron, what, what advice would you give him uh, in your career from what you've observed? What inspires you will probably uh, encourage your career more than the noise around that inspiration. And, uh, and noise can be money. Noise can be popularity. You will eventually achieve some of those if that's your, your career desire. And, and, and I can even, let me make it a local, simple example. Um, 
I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina, and for example here, a home builder who does a great job, I can think of a few who started out quite simply and they focused on the core elements. And I would say, going back to even the duty concept, they cared a lot, they were monitored, they allowed and invited monitoring or oversight by their customers, and they were loyal to their customer base. Mm -hmm. And today, they, they are very successful, and some of them, if we follow that in other areas, um, and in other businesses, I think we could find examples where people that have done that sort of thing have grown businesses to massive sizes and have solved big problems in the world in an excellent way. And it's, it started with somebody being determined to, f to fulfill that vision that they had for their lives. And that can be a great carpenter on a local basis, or it can be um, developing a pharmaceutical or a device or in the case of someone like Elon Musk, figuring out how to solve transportation issues so that it doesn't cause massive problems and, and congestion in our world, both from an uh, environmental standpoint and from a logistical standpoint. That's good. Well, what what is, if you look back on on your career, the importance of mentors and what you've seen with other CEOs? Um, how important is for somebody that's kind of starting out or earlier in their career to have mentors around them? I, I would call a mentor an imperative. Mm -hmm. um, there's, um, I'm, I've been involved with uh, probably five key mentors in my life, and. And right off the bat, I can, uh, unfortunately, a few have died, which is always sad. But uh, there's one gentleman that I'm involved with today who, um, who I knew is at 15, and I'm involved in an organization that he is, that's a leadership organization that he founded um, today and, uh, and doing very interesting things in the world. And I wouldn't be where I am today w without those mentors and my accountability to my vision for life and helping others would not be where it is today without those mentors. And, and I'm, I don't think I would be happy without those mentors. They're reminders. Um, they're that positive voices mm -hmm. that I hear in, in my head, particularly when I'm down or feel, like uh, circumstances are difficult. I hear mentors in my life say, you can stick in there. You can overcome this. And, uh, and I think that's an important thing to have those kinds of voices because too many times we've, you know, I think that all of us would resonate. We've got some sort of negative voice telling us why we can't do it. Right. We need to overcome those. And that's a key part of leadership. So, Tell me about uh, just some of the influences outside of mentors, uh, books that you've read that maybe recently or in the past that you would say would be really helpful for a CEO or a board member to uh, to read. Well, a few a, a few that I find um, that I would put on the top, you know, almost imperative or required reading list would be um, I, Good to Great is an is an excellent read. It's um, was. I think he released that in 2005. There's a book by Cynthia Montgomery named The Strategist. It's relatively short and pretty quick read. Um, if you're a private company or a family company, then I would suggest Generation to Generation by um, John Davis, a very good uh, book and, and a professor of mine at one point. Um, a couple books that Jay Lorsch has, has written on, uh, on board. He is a specific board expert, and he wrote one back to the drawing board that I would recommend. That leans a little bit more towards the larger public company arena, but um, it's a good read. And then uh, Collins followed up with a book called Great by Choice. And... Um, and then 
I, I'm a, I'm a big um, fan of some of the Eng, of, of a few English authors, and um, I happen to be a big Tolkien fan. Um, if if one has ever had a hankering to read Lord of the Rings, I think there's lots of leadership and culture lessons all throughout Lord Lord of the Rings. So if you've never read it, um, it's summertime. That's a that's a good read. Um, so those are a few that uh, I'll throw out that are off the top of my head. I um, I happen to be in, in uh, Oxford, England last week, and I walked by a pub called the Eagle and Child, where a little group of authors named the Inklings used to gather, uh, and uh, they would read read each other's manuscripts. And that's uh, two of those key authors with C.S. Lewis. I'm a big fan of some of his writings, and then also... Um, Tolkien and the two of them and some others would would gather and read their manuscripts there, which is a pretty cool thought. Not a bad idea to have like a small group that you sure. get together with um, regularly and talk about ideas. Good. So outside of work, I think it's always important when I talk to CEOs, it's always interesting to hear what they do outside of their, uh, their work and the importance of uh, having some other interests. Uh, tell me a little bit, some of your outside interests. Um, I, um, I'm, I am a, a big reader and I, uh, and I enjoy study. So that's, a, that's just kind of a natural part of what I spend my personal time doing. Uh, in my little office at home, I'm, I'm often in there studying away on fun parts of of literature and and uh, and hi- history is a, right now I'm reading Robert's book on Churchill which is a great read if you um but that's that's a heavy read it's about 1600 pages you got to be a big <laughs> Churchill fan to plow through that one but but um right now Mark I am spending a lot of my extra time because I'm delighted to have four wonderful little grandchildren all under the age of five and they live near me. So I'm, um, and, and I, uh, I'm a youth. I, I hope I maintain being a youthful sort of grandpa because I'm i uh, I'm an active outdoors person. I, I ski race. I'm okay. an Alpine wow. in college. I was an Alpine skier. And so I continue to do that. So I look forward to teaching them how to ski. And I, I get out and ski with friends, um, do a lot of hiking, uh, my wife and I do a lot of hiking and I, and that's a, I think that's a great leadership activity because it, it helps us, um, experience the benefits of the world that we have around us. And, uh, I'm an outdoorsy kind of person though. I do, I'm game for about any kind of sport <laughs> that, uh, that won't c- quite kill me at this age, but, uh, I'll try almost anything that, uh, that tests what I can do today in a sporting area. But uh, play a little golf here and there, but I'm not particularly good. But get out more for the cultural piece to spend an afternoon with uh, four people from time to time is a, is a good thing to do. Good. Well, any parting advice that you, you would give somebody in leadership? Um, I'm, I'm working with our, our team. We, we have um, uh, an ongoing suggestion period, but in our annual reviews, we particularly want uh, members of the team to uh, employees to put in suggestions. And one of the suggestions was to, to develop um, and focus on their strength finders. They all wanted to read strength finders. I'd started doing that on a, um, on a voluntary level for all employees. I, I offered to them that they, that will buy them a copy of strength finders and then take the test and then I'll meet with them. Um, and so they, but what they've wanted to do is a strength finder series of what we call a lunch and learn here at our office. And so um, they've asked me to lead that the first few times and then to have others come in and uh, guest speakers, but also some of the employees talk about it. So um, the thing I love about strength finders is the simple concept of we can spend our lives working on our, our problems or our weaknesses where if we spend more of our time on our strengths and doing what is good, we've got less time to waste on what is error filled or weak within us. And so I would encourage, I found it very encouraging to me to kind of rehash. I pulled out and dusted off my, when I first did strength finders about nine years ago. And uh, it was fascinating to think through the lens of, 
of um, teaching this in a way with my and walking through this with my employees. And it's a it's a humbling and and yet it's also an encouraging contextual um, activity to look at what what are you good at doing and how are you going to do it to help. And frankly, I think today we have an unusual opportunity to advance and to do more good for our civilization than ever before in the history of mankind. And uh, kind of going back to the notion that let's all pull together and uh, widen the prosperity base as wide as possible and change civilization together. And I think we do that by encouraging all of our strengths. It's hmm. good. Well, I sure appreciate uh, your, your insights and thoughts today, and this has been a lot of fun. Well, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate you having a podcast like this and encouraging this sort of thing. I hope this is helpful for someone out there. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.